the Word of God, the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 11. <clears throat> Going to read two verses, but we'll have several other verses as we move along. It's good to have a church here that loves Jesus. A church that wants the best that God has. A church where we believe in joining together and staying unified. Because the devil, he definitely wants to destroy. He wants to move in and do things that uh, is no part of the kingdom of God. So uh, God's going to keep blessing this church. And I say amen. amen. And it's because you're going to do your part. You are going to do your part and be the faithful member here at this wonderful church. Stand with me, if you will, as I read Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill. And look here, and all the firstborn of the animals. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for a wonderful Sunday. And I thank you, Lord, for this lighthouse that sits right here. Right in Fayette County, where this church leaves here after Sunday morning service and continues to live like you. Father, there's going to be so many opportunities this coming week where we're going to be able to share and to love and to care about other people. And Father, I pray you'll make us just like you in everything that we do. Father, I pray you'll forgive us for this past week, for the times we failed you. Uh, Lord, we might have lost our temper. We might have got mad. We might have done or said something we should not have done or said. And God, I pray you'll forgive us. Continue to fill us with your Spirit and use us up. And Father, I thank you for the moving of the Holy Spirit who is already here with us. And Father, we... Thank you for the Word of God. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now that's not the title of the message up on the screen, but the title of the message is Out of Bondage. I want to know today, are you in bondage or are you out of bondage? If you've been to the cross then, folks, you are out of bondage, and that's something we, be, we can be excited about. The term exodus means the way out, the way out of bondage. God gave us this wonderful book right here, the book of Exodus, to show us how to exit from the life of bondage and move right into the life of blessings. If you are experiencing today the life of blessings, it is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It is a sad thing to be a Christian and be defeated or to be in some type of bondage because of sin. In chapter 1 in this wonderful book, we have the bondage of the children of Israel in Egypt. We've read that. Chapters 2 through 6 is the preparation of the deliverer, Moses. Moses needed some prep time before he was going to ever face the one called Pharaoh. In chapter 7 through 10, we have the contest of Moses and the people of God with this gentleman called Pharaoh. Now, Egypt in the Bible is symbolic of a three-letter word called sin. And Pharaoh in the Bible is symbolic of a word by the name of Satan. In chapter 8, verse 25, Pharaoh comes along and he has some, some clever compromises, if you will, 
to Moses to keep him out of the promised land. So I want you to look at chapter 8 with me and verse 25. Let me flip back there. <clears throat> chapter 8 and verse 25. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. Now that's very interesting to me. You know what Pharaoh is saying? He's t saying, tell, tell Moses, there is no need for you to move out of Egypt. He says, Satan, listen, that's what he has said to us many times. If you want to worship God, Moses, or you want to be religious, you just go right ahead and do that. But do it right here in the place called Egypt. Now, the devil is very, very clever, isn't he? I'm glad one of these days he's going to be into the abyss where he will never get out again. But he may be saying to you this morning, right now, if you want to be religious, go right ahead. If you want to be religious, that's okay. Hey, go ahead and pray a little bit and read the Bible a little bit. Go to church a little bit and be nice a little bit. If you want to do that, then you go right ahead. That's okay. What the devil wants for every one of us to do and be is to be very, very religious but lost. Pharaoh was not against their worship, was he? And the devil is not against ours. He doesn't mind you coming to church as long as you stay in a lost condition. And I may be talking to somebody right now. And you have come to church on a regular basis, but you've never been to the cross of Calvary. You have never turned from your sin and by faith invited Jesus to come into your heart and life. Well, friend, today is a new day for you because you can move from religion to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Moses said to Pharaoh, we're not going to stay here. We are coming out of bondage. But you know what Pharaoh does? He keeps on trying. Look at chapter 8 with me and verse 28. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away. Hey, intercede for me. Now, Pharaoh kept on trying right here. God did not call them or us to remain in the wilderness. Did you know that? He wanted them and called them to the promised land. And I'm afraid this morning, in 2024, that's where a lot of Baptists are. They're in the wilderness, and they're going round and round and round in their Christian life, and there is no victory. God wanted Moses to move on over into Canaan land to the land that is flowing with milk and honey. Same way with us as Christians. God called you and me to the Spirit-filled life. How many times have we talked about that? Friend, we've worn it out, haven't we? God does not want you to remain in a carnal state and that simply means to be of the flesh. You're a believer, but you're defeated on a regular basis because your flesh is more powerful than the Spirit of God that is in you. Wow, yeah. wow listen. He wants us to move on over into Canaan land. Yeah. Hey, there's so much more to the Christian life. Oh, please learn this. Than coming to church on Sunday morning. There is so much more to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ than just coming to church for a couple of hours on Sunday morning. See, there is a life filled with joy. Oh, don't you have that joy this morning and that hope and that peace and that love and that victory? Some of you this morning may be going around and round in the wilderness and you never experience God. I want to tell you, friend, that gets very, very old 
in the Christian life. Pharaoh said, Moses, if you're going to go, hey, don't go very far. Just go on the outskirts, if you will, of Egypt. See, the devil does not want me. He does not want you going all the way with Jesus Christ. Well, Pharaoh still didn't give up. Look at chapter 10 and verse 8. We're moving on right here. Chapter 10 and verse 8 and 9. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? And Moses said, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flock and our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Moses, tell me who's going. And you know what Moses said? Hey, we're all going, Pharaoh. Well, don't take your family with you just yet. Leave them behind. You know what I found out about the devil a long time ago? He hates family Christianity. He hates the fact that men will not, well, he loves the fact that men won't take the lead and lead their family to the throne of God. Hey, men, are you listening? It is your responsibility as the man of the house to say to, to the wife and children, hey, let us pray. Let us look at the Word of God. And I believe one day you'll be held accountable for that. Listen, bring your wife and bring your children and bring your grandchildren to heaven with you. Now, Catherine Booth, you may know that name. She is the wife of the founder of the Salvation Army. This is what she said, and I quote, God, I will not stand before you without all my children. What a great statement. Listen, every one of her boys got saved and they became preachers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm coming to heaven, but I'm not going to leave my children behind. Well, you better act like Jesus in front of them. I am coming to heaven, and I'm not going to leave my precious grandchildren behind. You better be living like Jesus and telling them about Jesus and his wonderful blood. Well, Pharaoh still wouldn't give up, and I love this. One more compromise, and by the way, this is all introduction material. In chapter 10, look at verse 24. And let me find that right here. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. No animal, Pharaoh, will be left behind. We will serve, look here, folks, we will serve the Lord with all we have. In other words, we will serve God with our substance. Pharaoh wanted them to leave their substance back in Egypt. Some of you might right now be doing this. Some of you may be going to heaven, but the devil has your business. Uh-oh. Every Sunday we take an offering every week, and that's good. If we don't take it, the lights won't come on. We need to keep on taking an offering every week. Did you know that when we come together to worship the Lord by giving back to Him some that God has given to us? That is an act of worship and should be one of the happiest times during the entire service. 
Lord, I want to give back to you what you have given to me, and I'm thankful for that. See, every penny that you and I have, guess what? It belongs to God. <clears throat> this billfold I have belongs to God. I'm just checking it. Hey, your bank account belongs to God. Everything we have, that car you drive, the house you stay in, every time you get to open that refrigerator and see that food inside that refrigerator, my friend, everything we have belongs to God. <sighs> That's all introduction. I've got three points very quickly. First of all, I want you to know the word judgment. Turn to chapter 11 and verse 4. Verse 4 says, Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt. Now I want you to think with me for a moment about God's judgment. Many in the world today, they do not believe that God will destroy people one day. How can God, who is a loving God, do that? There's a lot of people who don't believe in hell. Friend, I don't know about you, but I've been invited to go there some. <laughs> Have you? A lot of people, though, don't believe in hell. They say God is a loving God and He wouldn't send anybody to hell. The God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. Amen. Now, right here is God bringing judgment on the firstborn of every household in the land of Egypt. You know about Egypt, don't you? They were filled with idols, and we got to be careful. Did you know you can put your child above God and that becomes your idol? You do know that. You can put money above God and that becomes your idol. And we could go right down the line listing all this stuff. See, there was a difference in God's sight between the Egyptians and the people of Israel. Now, what was it? Now, listen to this. As we read in the Word of God all the way through this book, the children of Israel, they murmured and complained Wow, sounds like a bunch of Baptists. They even made a golden calf and said, These are the gods of Israel that brought us up out of Egypt. You know what that tells me? The Israelites were no better than the Egyptians. It's pretty strange. Now, why did God, here's a great question, why did God bless and save the people of Israel and judge and punish the Egyptians. There's only one word, my friend, and you spell it G-R-A-C-E. It is the word grace. We move to the New Testament. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. See, salvation is not of yourself. Did you know that you're no better than anybody else? Deidre, did you know you're no better than your husband? You are no better than anybody else. So there was no difference in Egypt. There was no difference in the day of the flood. See, everybody outside the ark, what, ark, what happened to them? They drowned. Noah and his family went into the ark. <clears throat> hey, who shut the door? Friend, only one could shut the door, and that was God. But everybody else, y'all, everybody drowned. It did not make any difference the color of a person's skin. If you were a drunkard or a judge or a liar or a lawyer or whatever, if they did not get into the ark, they drowned. Friend, listen, if you don't go to the cross, it doesn't matter. If you don't go to the cross 
and receive the blood of Jesus washing away your sins, you'll never get into the kingdom of God. Think about Sodom. When God rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom, the Bible says everybody died. The leaders of the place were burned alongside men who swept the streets. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you don't accept that, then you do not accept according to God His Word. So there was a difference between the Egyptians and the people of Israel. And you know what? There's a difference between the saved and the unsaved. If any, if you're no different than your unsaved friends, you better check out your salvation. There's a difference between somebody who's been to the cross and somebody who hasn't. And my friend, there's coming a separation day. The saved are going to heaven, hallelujah. One person's going. And listen, we're either going to heaven or we're going to hell. Look at chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Stay with me now. But where is that? Here it is. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt and said this. This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Wow. You are beginning to live right now is what he's saying. A person does not begin to live in this world right here until they receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. How do I know that? You can go to the richest person in the world. You can go to all these people who have these millions and millions and dollars homes and all these vehicles in the garage, friend. That will not buy you happiness. It's only through the love of Jesus and that empty void is filled inside of you, I promise you, based on the Word of God. God said to Israel, this is the beginning of months. There had already been a nation, one commentary said, for a long time down in Egypt, but this was the beginning of life for them. The shedding of the blood of the Passover lamb. Hey, church, have you learned about the lamb? The lamb was the innocent dying for the guilty. A sinner would come to the gate and bring his lamb. Can you picture that with me? He would place his hand on the head of the lamb and begin to confess his sins. And his sins were symbolically removing the sinner From the center to the head of the lamb. And you know what the priest would do then? Then cut the throat of the lamb and catch the blood in a basin. And then he sprinkled the blood around the brazen altar. Then the lamb was placed on the altar and set fire to it. The offering went up in smoke to God. And the man's sin was forgiven Because the innocent lamb friend died in his place. Every man a lamb. Hey, men and women, boys and girls, do you have a lamb today? If it is not Jesus Christ, if he is not all you are trusting in, then my friend, according to the word of God, you have no salvation. Well, secondly, and I've got to move along here quickly, obey and be delivered. Look at chapter 12 and verse 29. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Now, did you get the phrase right there, at midnight? Up until the night Jesus was born in the the place of Bethlehem. Friend, this was the biggest night right here in all of history, in all of mankind. The Bible says darkness fell on Egypt. 
The Hebrews, picture them with me. When the sun went down, what were they? They were still slaves. When the sun came up the next morning, they were a nation on the march. But the Bible says darkness fell on Egypt. Darkness in Pharaoh's palace. I want you to picture that night. There was a full moon. Pharaoh was asleep in the palace. All the attendants were asleep. Those who slept on boats on the Nile River, they were asleep. The poor people in their huts, they were asleep. Everything in Egypt that night was at rest and everything was very quiet. Egypt was asleep. But the land of Goshen, in the Hebrew settlement, they were awake. You know why? Because Moses had addressed them and told them what they are to do in preparation for going to the promised land. Now look at chapter 12 and verse 3. Stay with me now. Speak to all the congregation of Israel and say this, Moses, on the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb. And that was in our calendar year in April. Now I'm not going to read all this down through here, but I'm going to read just a little bit of it. Look at verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. Verse 6, you shall keep it into the 14th day of the same month. And verse 7, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts. Then they shall eat the flesh that night, roast it in fire. Oh, and it goes on and on, and we know the story. Find a lamb, people, no blemish. And bring it into your home. Hey, you can even make it a pet. Hey, the children were petting on the lamb. They got close to that lamb. But then after a certain amount of time, you are to kill the lamb. Take the blood, smear it on the doorpost on both sides, and smear it over the door. And then the Bible says take the lamb and roast it in a prescribed way, and put the lamb in the middle of the table. Eat the lamb as a family unit very quickly, ready to move out. Hey, get your clothes on. Have your traveling sandals on. Look at the scene. Notice the scene at midnight when the death angel passes over Egypt. Pharaoh begins to be uneasy in his bed. You see him? And it's midnight. Guess what? God's promise is coming true. Hey, friend, you got what you need right here. God's promises have always come true, and God's promise will always come true. Pharaoh is now defeated, the Bible says, and his son is dead. Now picture this, in every household in Egypt, the firstborn was dead. There was death <clears throat> in the palace, there was death in the temple, death on the Nile, death in the fields, the firstborn of the cattle had died. There was death and death and more death all over Egypt at midnight. But not in the land of Goshen, the Hebrew community. You know why? Because they obeyed God's word. Friend, obeying God's word will keep you out of a lot of trouble. Keep you out of a lot of heartache. The Bible says there was a sorrow, a cry that the world had never heard before. Can you imagine? Listen, the firstborn of four or five million people. So we have the beginning of Passover, and I want to quickly move to the third point of the message. The Passover teaches us three beautiful principles, and here they are. Number one. There is no salvation 
except by the grace of God. Deuteronomy 7, 7, the Hebrews were selected because God loved them. You know, the Hebrews could have said, well, you know what? We are descendants of Abraham. I mean, we're special to God. Or we didn't worship the pagan gods like the Egyptians did. But we know it was all because of grace. Secondly, grace is received by faith. Grace is God's action. Faith is always man's response. If a Hebrew man, listen to this, if a Hebrew man's response would have been, I don't like all this blood business. I'm not going to cut the lamb and put the blood over the door and on the doorpost. Listen, friend, the firstborn in his family would have died. God's grace, man's faith. And then thirdly, unless the lamb is killed, there is no salvation. Now, please don't miss this. Without the shedding of blood. There's no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood. Hey, Lord, hey, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for somebody like me. Lord, you didn't have to, but you love me, Lord. You love me that much that you were willing to suffer and die. Friend, without the shedding of blood. Way back in the Old Testament is a picture, y'all, a picture of, of what was coming when Jesus one day would die on the cross. To everybody in the church house this morning, sin leads to death. We either die in our sin, or there is a perfect substitute that takes our place. A simple question, where is your sin? If if your sin this morning is still on you, then you're in trouble. It will mean hell and all that goes with it if your sin is still on you. But there's good news. Your sin and my sin can be on Jesus. Friend, he paid the price. Friend, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. The blood of Jesus. But you know what? You've got to receive it. You give somebody a gift, they reach out and they receive it. You as a lost person must reach out and receive the free gift of salvation. To everybody in the church house on this Sunday in February... Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you received what He did for you on the cross over 2,000 years ago? Friend, there's only one way I'm going to heaven, through repentance and faith. Well, preacher, you're the preacher. You're the pastor of Hickory with me. That does not matter. It's only by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that I get to go to heaven one day. Now, I'm not understanding that up on the board right now. I do know what it is. But the message is titled about bondage. And I want to ask you, are you in bondage or are you out of bondage? I just thought I'd draw everybody's attention to that again. I'm just a mean person. (laughs) Are you in bondage or are you out of bondage? Today, we open the Bible, and God offers you to come to Him and be set free. Oh, friend, there's nothing like it. There's going to be a lot of Baptists in hell, but there will be no one in hell that has received Jesus as Lord and Savior. How do I know that? The Bible tells me so. Doesn't matter your age right now. What really matters is if you have turned from your sin 
and ask the Lord to come into your heart and life. Friend, I'm going to heaven. How about you? I'm on my way to heaven this morning. How about you? Will you stand with me? If you'll bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Word of God. And I thank you for the true story of how all those Israelites led by a man who didn't feel worthy, him and his brother, Lord, you used them in a mighty way to lead those children out of Egypt. Thank you, Lord, for all the miracles you gave them, and thank you, Lord, for all the miracles that we're having right here. And God, we still need some more right now. Father, I pray you'll move. Oh, Lord, maybe today like a gentle breeze and just blow on every one of us. And Lord, I pray if we're lost, we'll run down the aisle and get saved. Father, there's some people who are Christians and they've got a little bondage. And I pray, God, they'll come and confess that sin and be set free this morning. Lord, there are people who need to come and join this church. People need to come and pray for lost loved ones and for this crippled nation that we live in, Lord. God, we need to lift up our prayers to you. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.